prayer, and then we'll get into the, the Word. Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we want to thank you for another day of life. Thank you for watching over us this last weekend, and we, we just praise you for the beautiful fall colors. Lord, as we open up your Word, we once again recognize that your Bible says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us into all truth tonight. And we want to thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the uh, little um, bit of, of, of uh, activity that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take uh, your Bible. Um, just as we begin here, put this chiasm back on the screen once again. And by the way, I don't want you to feel um, um, frustrated or anything if you don't understand what chiasms are yet. Um, I'm going to share with you why I'm sharing them in just a few minutes. Um, but I just want you to notice, once again, that it's laid out as a chiasm, parallels the, the beginning of the book with the last of the book, and then works its way in, and then there's a middle. Okay? So what I want you to do is I want to take out your Bibles, if you've got a Bible or if there's a pew Bible there, and I want you to go to the book of Revelation, and I want you to, to count how many pages there are in your Bible in the book of Revelation. Find out where the center is. What we're looking for is the center of the book of Revelation. Okay? And I just, I'm doing this as, as a, a study, as a research project. I've been doing this in every series I've been doing lately, and uh, it always comes true except for one exception I'll share in a minute. So we're looking at the center, trying to find the center of the book of Revelation. Just count those pages from where it begins to where it ends. And then figure out where the center is and tell me where the center of Revelation is. I did this with the Pew Bible that you have here, and uh, it comes out exactly right. So, so where, where does yours end? <laughs> What's the answer? Okay. That's no fair. You've got to help me out here. <laughs> What's that? Okay. Uh, what you'll find, I think, is, uh, and it depends... If you have a study Bible where there's a lot of extra notes in it, sometimes that throws it off. But typically, every Bible that I have picked up so far brings you to the center being chapter 12, chapter 13, you know, 11, 12, 13, right in there. Okay? And that's important, especially for our subject tonight. Because remember, what's the most important part of a chiasm? What's in the center? Yeah, so there's a reason that God had John, or I guess I, I believe that God moved John to write this in a chiastic structure, because in the very center is the most important thing that he wants us to remember. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things, but we're going to find that in the very center, we're going we're to be introduced to the woman, the dragon, and the child. So I'd like you to turn in Revelation chapter 12, if you do have your Bibles, and we're going to read the first verses there. Now, this, this particular chapter is a prophecy all in its own right, and we'll have an opportunity to go through it basically verse by verse at another time. But it identifies the major players in the book of Revelation. Okay? So let's read uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness 
where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. All right, so as we look at this, and there's obviously a lot more to the chapter, but that introduces the major players in uh, the book of Revelation. They're right in the center, and they have all, everything to do with what we're going to talk about tonight, but they also have everything to do with everything else that's happening in, um, in the Bible that we've already gone through. And so we're going to come back to the series of seven churches, seven seals, and the next one is seven trumpets later. But it's important for us to answer this question tonight as we, we go. So you've already noticed as we've gone through the two uh, prophecies, the seven churches and the seven seals, that there's a lot of conflict in Revelation. Have you seen that? Yeah, a whole lot of conflict there. And so we want to try to answer the question, why is there so much conflict? Well, in one sense, we could say, well, it just kind of reflects the kind of world we live in, right? I mean, they had conflict then. Do we have conflict today? We certainly do. In fact, a new one just broke out, right, the other day. And so we want to figure out where that conflict comes from. Well, the next two verses in chapter 12, verse 7 and 8, I have on the screen, and it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So when I first became a Christian, this, this really startled me, because, you know, I had... Um, I was very cognizant of, the, of man's inhumanity to man, you know, and our, our, our tendency to, to start wars, you know, and to afflict one another in all sorts of different ways. And so I figured that war was an invention of mankind. But lo and behold, the Bible tells us that where did, where did war start out? In heaven, yeah. Now, my father was a Marine. He joined up during World War II and uh, was in some of the major battles in World War II. And then when he came home, he got out, but then went to college. And when uh, he was in college, the Korean War broke out. So he knew he was going to get called up. And so they were going to call him up into the Army. And so he decided, no, I don't want to be an um, Army man. I want to be a Marine. And so he made sure he, got, he went into the Marines. Well, after Korea, he decided to make a career of it. And he ended up going through three tours of, of um, um, Vietnam. And so my dad was a warrior. You know, that's just what he was. And so I, I, I never was in the Marines or anything like that, but I had a pretty, what I would say, unhealthy dose of what war was all about growing up. And it's a horrible thing. There's nothing good about it, really. And so to find out that war was developed or first came into existence in heaven was really a shock to me. So uh, this problem of war, I should say, this problem of what war creates, I should say, and the kind of collateral damage that war creates in our society is one that has puzzled people for centuries. I mean, this is not new. We look at what's happening over in Israel and Palestine today, and we're just appalled by the kind of carnage that is taking place, right? How can this, how can God be God, you know, and allow this kind of thing to happen? Now, there's a lot of stuff that happens that's not because of war, but, you know, um, you, you all have heard about the uh, drug cartels down in, down in uh, Mexico. Well, a lot of the stuff that happens is because the cartels war against each other. You know, there's other cartels, and so they have wars between them. So there's, there's lots of different kinds of wars. They're not just military. This problem, uh, Epicurus, uh, a Greek philosopher, struggled with back in uh, about three, uh, no, 400 uh, B.C., before Christ. And he said this, is God willing to prevent evil, but is not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent, malevolent, meaning he's bad. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? 
is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? In other words, obviously, Epicurus had a problem with the concept of God. He felt that as he looked out at his world, and this is back in 300, 400 BC, that, you know, why would God allow this kind of thing to happen? In our, in our own day, there are many people that ask the question, if God is all-powerful, why didn't he create a world without suffering and evil? Isn't that a legitimate question? Sure it is. It's a very legitimate question. And in fact, it, we, we can even go further than that because there are people who have bad things happen to them that they just don't understand. Lord, why did you take our oldest daughter, who was the one that was going to take care of us in our old age, right? Why did you allow those people to, my, my family, to die of COVID, you know, two years ago? Why did you allow that accident? If you're a good God, and I'm a praying person, I prayed for them, why didn't they live? You see, we, we, uh, humanity has been filled with those kind of questions from, from the very beginning, all the way back to Epicurus's time, all the way up to our time. And so this is what um, David, King David, was struggling with when we looked at this Psalms, Psalms uh, 50, or, or 73, verse 12 and 13. This is the first part of it. Uh, a couple nights ago, because he says, this is what the with wicked are like. He's just described them as being free of pain and heartache and, you know, strong, you know, and able to overcome and all that sort of a thing. And he says, this is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. So David's struggling with this too. That he's, he's uh, looking at the, the wealth and prosperity of, of evil people, and he's thinking, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to be good and, and a moral person. But yet I keep getting knocked down and, you know, people judge me incorrectly or whatever. But they seem to have no problem. But then, of course, the following verse is what we looked at, too. And that's, that is verse 16 and 17. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. So David came to an understanding of this very question. What, why is there so much pain and suffering? Why does God allow that? And where did he find it? He found it in the sanctuary, actually. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time in the sanctuary tonight, but we will see that as we progress through this series. But I want you to notice this uh, statement he says, it was too painful for me. Now, that Hebrew word means that it was too wearisome. In other words, he spent, he spent hours, maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe months, you know, kind of pulling his hair out, trying to figure this out. How does this make sense? that there's a good God, a loving God, and yet all this happens and, and evil men get away with murder, right? So it's a, it's a problem that the Bible talks about. It's a problem that all people have dealt with uh, through all ages. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to do a Bible study, all right? And we're going to do one the way that Jesus taught us to study the Bible. Did you know that Jesus teaches, teaches us how to study the Bible? You may not know that, but this was a revelation to me, and it made all the difference in the world in my understanding the Bible. When I first became a Christian, I became a Pentecostal Christian. That's where I gave my heart to the Lord. Pentecostals are beautiful people, but they really didn't teach me how to study the Bible. And so I ended up coming to, uh, getting involved with some people that taught me how to study the Bible. And so this is a story that takes place on the road to Emmaus. Some of you may have heard of it. It's when Jesus has been crucified. He's been resurrected. It's on that Sunday morning. But none of the disciples believe it yet that he's been resurrected. They're afraid that they're going to be next to be crucified. Okay? And so there's two disciples going home from Jerusalem. And Jesus shows up and walks with them. And they talk with him. He, he blinds their eyes so they can't tell who it is, as only God is able to do. There's sometimes I'd like to be able to walk in some places, you know, and not be seen. Um, but I've never been able to figure out how to do that. But Jesus had that ability. And so as he's walking with them, 
And finally, after they tell him all their woes, you know, and the fact that Jesus has died and everything, it comes to, uh, this is found in Luke 24, it comes to verse 27. And so Jesus says, or it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now this, in a nutshell, is where Jesus teaches us how to study the Bible. So what is he doing? What's the subject? The subject is the Messiah, right? Because the, the two disciples had said, we thought he was the prophet. We thought he was he who was to save us, was the, the Messiah, right? So the subject is the Messiah, it's him. And how does he go about studying? What does it say? It says, beginning where? At Moses. What does he mean by Moses? That's the first five books of the Bible. That's what all the Jews understood. Those are the first five books of the Bible. So he begins at Genesis, and then all the prophets. What's that? That's all the rest of the Bible, right? Yeah, all the other books, because all the other books were written by prophets. So what Jesus does is he studies by subject. His subject is himself, it's the Messiah, and he brings out things that it says about the Messiah in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then all the other books, you see? Because they all, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think you have eternal life. They are they that testify of me. So every book of the Bible testifies about Jesus. So Jesus is teaching them to study by subject. Whatever subject you want, you can do this with angels. You want to know about angels? Study by subject. You want to know about the origin of evil? That's what we're going to do tonight, okay? So that's how we're to study. But it goes on, and, and, and of course, that's, I'm showing the uh, extent of the Old Testament there. He goes through all those books that have been written and shows how they speak about him, except for the New Testament, because that wasn't written yet. But then as Isaiah 8, verse 20, uh, the prophet Isaiah tells us something very important. To the law and to the testimony, the law is the first five books of the Bible. The testimony is the testimony of the prophets, so according to the Bible. If they speak not according to this word, it's because what? There is no light in them. Now that's a pretty confrontational statement. I found that I was confronted by a lot of these kind of statements when I, when I first uh, became a Christian. Because I believed that there was a little bit of truth everywhere. Okay? That's what I believed. But this says that if they don't speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Now, I'm going to develop that and flesh that out a later time, but um, we'll just go on from there. So it has to agree with whatever's in the Bible. And then it says in Isaiah 28, verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? You know, to help to understand the Bible. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, or precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. In other words, when you study by subject, you find everything that's written in the Bible about your subject, this Messiah here. And you put those all together, and by the time you're done, you'll have a very clear understanding about what the Bible says about the Messiah. Now, this is nothing new. I used to do that when I was in college, when, when, I was in, when I was out in the world. I knew that if I needed to study up on a certain subject, I'd go back to the index, look up the subject of whatever I was weak on, and study that sub, you know, study all those references there, you know, and then I'd, that I'd know it better. So it's a pretty simple thing, but that's where the Bible says how to study. So the Bible is lifted up as the source of our information and our knowledge that we need to, to have. And of course, we know that the, the sanctuary is, is where we're going to be able to find the truth about the history of mankind and all this problem of sin and suffering and why God allows suffering in our world. All right, so we looked at that, and I'm bringing this up again, and I'll, I'll bring out the reason for it in just a minute. Um, Probably one of these times I'm going to print this off and give this to you. Uh, there's not too many of you that will probably hang it up on your wall and frame it and stuff, you know. But I want you to be able to see it for a very important reason, all right? Here is another one. We looked at this the other night, Revelation 2, 
verse 18 through 28, is laid out as a chiasm. This is very intricate. These things are, and, and Revelation 12, what we're studying tonight, is actually another chiasm. I mean, Revelation is a chiasm within a chiasm within a chiasm within a chiasm. I mean, it's just stunning, is what it is. And, and uh, oh, I took it out. I did take that out. Well, in any case, the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this is because what I've found, friends, is that revelation is not a hodgepodge of things just pasted together. It is very, very detailed. It is designed. And the way it's designed is it's not designed by mankind. There is no man that could do all this, put it together in this, in this way. I mean, you're talking about so much intricate, um, fascinating, uh, interwoven themes and chiastic structures and other things of that nature that it has to be divine, you see. It's just, a, a, it's amazing. And so what we see here is that Revelation 12, verse 3 says, And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon. So that's the first one we're going to look at. Three entities, the dragon, the woman, and the child. We're going to look at the origin of the dragon tonight. So where did this dragon come from? What exactly does it mean? Now the Bible, or the, the book of Revelation is written in symbolic language, right? So we shouldn't necessarily expect to see a, 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 a creature like this, you know, out in the world. Um, that's what we need to get through our minds. We're not going to see something about, about this in the fossil record, all right? This is a, 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 a figure, it is symbolic, and it's designed to teach us something. And we'll find out what the heads represent at another time. Uh, but in any case, why was there this war in heaven? And of course, the next question is, where did this dragon come from? All right? So where did the devil come from that we find there? Is there a place in the Bible that tells us where his origin was? What we realize is Revelation reveals an angelic struggle between good and evil. Okay, there's a back and forth. Obviously, with this war that we just read about in chapter 12, verse 7 uh, through 9, there's somebody that's in the right, and there's somebody in the wrong, right? The dragon is kicked out of heaven. So that kind of gives you an indication that who's, who's in the wrong? The dragon, he's kicked out of heaven, right? If you kick, kicked out of a perfect place uh, with God, then there must be something wrong with you. There's something uh, going wrong here. And that is where the origin of all the disaster that we find in our world comes from. The origin of cancer, uh, the death that we experience here, any sorrows, any pain, drugs, divorce, alcohol, any, anything that, that, that we see is disaster and not of a perfect nature, it all comes from that origin, that war that started in heaven. Okay? In fact, it's, uh, it's, kind of like, uh, it's kind of like Pandora's box. I think I have a picture of that here in just a second. But the Lord tells us something in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. He says, now all these things happen to them, speaking about the things happening to the Israelites in the Old Testament, and they were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. We looked at that the other night. So what I'm saying here is that the things that happened in the Old Testament are designed to be admonitions to us. They're designed to help us to understand. Now, how many of you would like to understand? How many of you especially would like to understand this problem of good and evil in the world and why there's so much suffering and why it, uh, God doesn't answer my prayers like I want him to or whatever it may be? So what we're going to see here is that there was a beautiful angelic being in heaven that rebelled against God. So let's take a look at it. Let's set it up with a story about Satan. Uh, because remember in Revelation chapter 12, it said that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of gold called the devil and Satan. Okay, so we know he's got a, a few aliases here. So 
One of the subjects that we can study to find out about him is the word Satan. So we look up Satan and we find a fascinating story in the book of Job. Now, the book of Job, we looked at it just briefly the other night, but we're going to go through it a little bit more systematically here tonight. Now, <clears throat> what's happening here is that God has called a council. Evidently, God has this council of different beings that come from the different worlds uh, that, he con that he has created. All right? So, in this particular instance, it says, Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. This is Job 1, 6 through 8. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. We talked about the other night that that means he's in control. He's, he's the king of this world. Okay. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan was basically uh, saying that he's in control. Everybody bows down to him. And so God points out a man that doesn't bow down to him. Now, wouldn't you like to be that man? I mean, sometimes you like to hide, don't you? And, but here God points out Job, says, no, he's not bowing down to you. He, he's a blameless uh, man. He shuns evil. And then Satan says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. In other words, of course he's going to worship you. Of course he's going to be, be um, uh, allegiant to you. You know, you're a, a big Santa Claus to him, in a sense, right? And so then just Satan goes on and says, But now... Stretch out your hand and touch all he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So Satan challenges God. You know, he says, no, you haven't been, being, being, you haven't been playing fair. Let me at him, basically, and we'll see how long he worships you. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I want you to notice something here that he says, God says, all that he has is, is what? In your power, Satan. So God gives Satan permission. Satan has made a proposition here. He's challenged God, right? Saying that the only reason this man worships you is because you're so good to him. Of course he's going to worship you. And so, so God says, okay, well, let's see if you're right. And so he allows Satan to touch him. So the rest of the story goes on to say how, how the devil goes down and he incites some of the local tribes to attack Job and to carry off his, all his property, basically. Takes his donkeys, his camels, his sheep, you know, just wipes out all of his possessions. On top of that, he causes a great storm to fall on his children who are having a simple party together, maybe it was somebody's birthday, I don't know, but they're all together in one house, causes the house to fall in and they're all killed. And so when that happens, Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He doesn't curse God, he just accepts the fate of what happens. Now it doesn't tell us all of it, but I'm certain that Job was pretty, pretty uh, grieving you know, during that time. Pretty difficult. So then there's another story now that continues in chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, after this one happens. Then the Lord said, uh, I should say that Satan comes again to one of these meetings up there in heaven. Obviously, uh, Satan was not in heaven where God is, but he had access to this particular gathering. Okay, So he's come there again and presenting himself as the ruler of earth. And then the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, here's an interesting thought. Who does, it say, who does God say does the, 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 the destruction here? It appears as though God is taking responsibility for it, isn't he? 
Because after all, could Satan have access to Job unless God gave him access? That appears to be the case, right? So God gives him access. This is a quite a fascinating story. And so uh, Job still hangs on, and, and uh, even though it's destroyed all his stuff, he still hangs on. But then Satan comes back and answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So this controversy, this, this game, uh, this, this challenge, right, that, uh, that uh, Satan has thrown at God is continued now. Skin for skin, you know. Let him get sick, and let's see how, far, how long he lasts. Now I want you to notice what it says here, that who is causing the calamity to befall Job? What does it say? God says to Satan, behold, he is in your hand. So let's be clear here that according to the Bible, all the evil that befalls Satan or, 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 or Job is because of Satan. Amen. Now, we've already recognized that God has, get, has given permission. Okay, so there is, he's, he's in the equation. But it's very clear that Satan is the one that calls all the woes and the misery to Satan. Okay, does that make sense? All right, let's go on. So, let's ask the question, why? And, and this is how I phrase it. Why does God even allow this contest? Right? Why in the world would this be okay to do? I mean, as a parent, would you be willing to single out one of your kids to have them go through this kind of a trial to see if they're going to be, you know, faithful to you? It seems abominable, doesn't it? Doesn't make sense. So there must be something else behind the scenes that we're not seeing. So let's continue to unwrap this. So we found that, that Satan is kicked out of heaven. He's, he's fallen and he's, evidently he's able to draw one third of the angels with him as well. So how did that happen? Because we've got this character Satan that's causing all this calamity to befall Job and then causing war and all that sort of thing. So when you do this study by subject, you come up with a place in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, where God says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, how many of you know that Lucifer is also Satan? Yeah, I think we all know that. I was not raised a Christian, and I knew it, you know. I mean, you know where I learned most of my theology? From Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah. I learned about, you know, when you, when you die, your ghost goes to heaven. In Saturday morning cartoons. You ever seen Casper the Friendly Ghost? Yeah. I, I learned about, about Lucifer, the devil, you know. I knew what he looked like, you know, pitchfork and horns and all. Yeah, you can, you can see, of course, there's a little bit of a problem with learning it from the cartoons, can't you? But notice what it says here in the Bible. So how you are fallen from heaven, you know, we know the Bible says that Satan fell or the dragon fell from heaven. Here is somebody that falls from heaven. O son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, so this is God telling us what was in Satan's heart or Lucifer's heart that caused him to go from heaven or come down from heaven. I will ascend into heaven, Lucifer says. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like who? The Most High. So what was the sin, what was the problem that, that Lucifer had? He wanted to be God, right? Here we have a situation where a created being gets it in their head that they ought to be God. It's an amazing and astonishing revelation here. Now notice with me how many times that he says, I. You see, God can read our thoughts, and he's obviously telling us the thoughts and the, the things that Satan was saying in his heart. He has a problem with the I, doesn't he? He wants to be the one and 
and on top. But God goes on to say, yet you shall be brought down to Seol, that's a word for the grave in the, in the Hebrew, to the lowest depths of the pit. So God reveals to us the thinking of Satan, why he got cast out of, of heaven, or Lucifer, and that he wanted to be God. So here is something that is revealed to us very quickly. Evidently, God gave all of his creatures the power of choice. Because you can't be accused of something that supposedly you've done wrong if you've been programmed to always do a certain thing, right? So we're going to see that a little bit more in just a second here. So evidently, Lucifer was son of the morning. He was a powerful angel in heaven. He was perfect when he was created. In fact, we'll see that in just a second. Uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 12, talking again about this fallen angel. Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So did God create a perfect Lucifer? Yeah, he was perfect in all his ways. He was perfect uh, in beauty and full of wisdom, seal of perfection. In fact, he might have been the very first angelic being he made. Could have been. Um, we'll see uh, maybe where that fits here in just a second. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Now that gives us a clue to where in the pantheon or where in the, the structure, the, the, the um, uh, authority structure, uh, Lucifer was. Because when it says the anointed cherub, what does that refer us to? That covers, I should say. The anointed cherub who covers. Well, what should come into your mind is the sanctuary. Because in the most holy place of the sanctuary, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and God had Moses make it exactly as the pattern he showed him on the mount. In other words, exactly as the look to look like the one in heaven, except they wouldn't be real angels. And over this ark would be two anointing or covering cherubims or angels. Lucifer was one of those covering cherub. Now, what, we, what I haven't mentioned to you, you see that kind of glow between the two angels? That was considered the Shekinah glory of God. That was a representation of God himself. So what these two angels are, 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 are they're the guardians right next to the presence of God. They were that close to God. So this is not a situation where Lucifer was just a, you know, a um, copy number 572, you know, uh, angel. You know, and he was out in the back 40 of the universe, you know, doing work. No, this was an angel that was covering the Shekinah glory of God. This was an angel that knew exactly what God was like. And as he beheld God, somehow he began to want to be not the covering angel, but he wanted to be God himself. All right? So it goes on. Ezekiel 28, verse 14. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So God reveals to us that this covering cherub called uh, Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan and the dragon, was a perfect being until what? Iniquity was found in you. Now let me ask you something. How does a boy or a girl grow up to be a mass murderer. I mean, every boy and girl um, kind of basically start the same way. They're babies, you know, they grow, and they're pretty innocent, right? Most kids are pretty innocent. Every once in a while you get one that you wonder, <laughs> you know, but most of them are pretty innocent. They don't have any of the bad habits yet. But how do they end up growing up to possibly eventually become a mass murderer? They make choices through their lives, don't they? You know, you and I are a product of our choices. And when you hear my story, you'll understand some of the bad choices I made that made me into the bad person that I was. But the good news is, is God can reverse that. 
Amen. And so what happens is that Lucifer began to make choices in his mind about his position. Uh, the rest of the story continues here and helps us understand. So iniquity was found in Lucifer. So this is the origin of sin and all the problems that we have in the world. So evidently what was happening is that as Lucifer was performing his duties, and he was like an archangel, he was over the other angels because he was the first, he was one of the most important, because I don't think for a minute that the covering cherub are always standing before God. I think that God sends them out on missions sometimes, you know, just like he does us. We have vice presidents. They don't just stand right around the president all the time. God, uh, the president sends them out. And so evidently Lucifer began to go out and to share some of his questions. He began to question God's uh, faithfulness, his rulership and all. And it says in Isaiah, uh, remember we saw this, I'm not going to go over that again, but uh, he, this is where sin began. And when we saw that five different times, he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be the mo most high. It's interesting that the very middle letter of sin is what? Is I. Because sin is an I problem. We're thinking too much about ourselves, you see. And that's what Lucifer was doing. He was beginning to question, why can't I have that position? Why can't I? I should be treated better than I am. I deserve this. I deserve that. And evidently what he was doing is he was focusing so much on that that he, it was changing him. And friends, I know for a fact that when you begin to focus on one thing exclusively, it begins to change you. It begins to transform you, whatever it is. Okay? If you're negative all the time, you know one of the reasons why we shouldn't be watching the news or reading the news all the time? Because it's always negative. And you know what it will do to us? It will eventually turn us negative. Right? People get depressed by just reading all the negative news all the time. And so that's a, by beholding you become changed. Ezekiel 28 verse 16 so God goes on to say, by the abundance of your trading, that word trading, um, um, I think it's in the King James, it's peddling, you became filled with violence within. You know what that word means? It means merchandising. It's like a peddler who is selling goods. And so what he was doing is he was peddling his doubts. He was constantly thinking about them. You know what happens when you constantly think about what you believe somebody did wrong to you? You rehearse it over and over again. Does it get smaller? No, it gets bigger and bigger. See, this is what's happening to Lucifer. He's peddling this. He's trading these, these ideas. And it caused him to become filled with violence within. And you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub from the midst of the firing stones. So this tells us the origin of, of the controversy, where that war in heaven came from. God got to the point where he could not tolerate Lucifer in heaven anymore because he was affecting all the other um, angels. You, you all have probably had the experience where you have one bad potato in a bag. What happens? It eventually spreads to the rest of them, right? And that's what was happening. And unfortunately, Lucifer was so intelligent, had so much wisdom, supposedly anyway, but was so intelligent that he was able to convince one-third of the angels to go with him. That's an incredible, astonishing thing. These are unfallen beings. And so verse 17, it goes on. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Evidently, Lucifer was the first narcissist. He was the one that he was looking in the mirror and saying, you're so beautiful. I remember when my, our daughter was born, our first daughter, she was a beautiful baby. And unfortunately, everybody was telling her that. And so one day, my wife caught her, heard her in the other room when she started talking. She was sitting or standing before the mirror on the back of the door. And she was looking at the mirror and she was saying, you're so beautiful, I can't stand it. Is that good for a kid? 
It's funny, right? It is funny, but it's not good for a kid, right? Because it goes to their head. And this is, unfortunately, what was happening to Lucifer. He corrupted his wisdom for the sake of his splendor. So here's what Lucifer desired. He wanted a higher position. He wanted an exalted throne. And he wanted rulership and dominance. And this is what blows us away. How is it possible, you might say, Pastor Stewart, that, that a created being can think that he can become God? You know, it sounds so, so ludicrous. It doesn't make any sense. But yet, this is the most intelligent being that's ever been created. So, it happened, as the Bible says. So, Lucifer questioned God's authority. He questioned God's fairness. And he began to spread that out amongst the other angels. He wanted, uh, he began to, you know, insinuate things about God. I don't think he went out there right away and just started, you know, God's not fair and all that. I think he started just uh, peddling it, you know, kind of just subtly. saying, well, you know, is, you think that God's doing it right? You know, maybe it could be a done a better way, that sort of a thing. And so Lucifer challenged God. And what we see here is God now had a problem. So let's think for a moment about how God can deal with the problem, okay? So the first thing he can do, what were God's options? Well, he could destroy Lucifer right away, right? I mean, some of us would think, yeah, let's do that. I mean, we wouldn't have to go through all what we've been going through for almost 6,000 years here if he had just destroyed him. But let's think about it. Did anybody know what sin was all about at that point? No, they were all perfect. You see, we grow up with it. And we come at this equation thinking, well, there's an obvious answer here, just destroy him. But because we know what sin's about. We've dealt with it. We've, we've, we've um, experienced the effects of it, right? But if God had done that, what would the other angels have done? They would have thought, whoa, just sapped him out of existence. Maybe Lucifer was right. See? And so God had to be careful. He couldn't do that. So he could just, the second option is he could just ignore Lucifer. How well does that work? You can't ignore when, when sin has come in the camp, right? When problems take place. All you parents know that. At some point, you've got to correct that kid, right? There has to be, otherwise he's going to affect the rest of them and he's going to make your life miserable. So um, he, he couldn't ignore him. But then the third option is give time for the universe to see the results of Lucifer's rebellion. You see, the world, the, the, the universe had never seen this happen before. They never, under, they didn't understand where Lucifer was coming from. I don't even believe Lucifer understood it. But God knew where it was going. And every parent knows when children make a certain decision, even though you may not have gone down exactly that road, it's a close enough road that you know where it's going, but they don't know. You see, and that's the way the rest of the universe was. And so if God was to punish Lucifer all the, uh, without them knowing the consequences of it, there would have been a lot of fear created in the world that had never been created before. So God allows the contest to take place. That's what's happening in the book of Job. Okay? He allows it because he has to let people see this is the results of what takes place when you, when you um, allow sin in the life. Jesus says in um, uh, John 8, 44, he says, you are of your father the devil, he's talking to the Jewish leaders, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So as Jesus begins his ministry, he's challenged with, with, uh, by the leaders there, and he very clearly tells them what, who they're like. They're not following God their father, they're following Lucifer their father, because he's a liar and he's, and he's a murderer, and he knows, Jesus knows they want to murder him. So Revelation 12 verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. 
So all of this happened sometime in the distant past in heaven, and God chose to allow Satan to be cast down to the earth. Lucky us, right? And ever since then, Pandora's box has been opened. Well, why was it opened? Uh, it says a third of the part, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. So a third would come down. So here we have this problem that Satan can appear as an angel of light. And that's where we get into trouble a lot of times, is that we can have things or situations come to us and appear as though they're okay. But if they're not according to us, saith the Lord, then, and we follow them, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. So how did planet Earth become involved in this cosmic conflict? Remember in Genesis 1, Jesus, uh, Genesis 1, chapter 28, God created all things and they were very good. Remember that? And he put in the Garden of Eden uh, Adam and Eve. And he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over everything that moves on the earth. So here, God gives dominion to Adam and Eve. And so what that means is Adam then was the king of the earth. Eve was the queen of earth. They were the ones that were, in a sense, the rulers of earth. And so that's where it originally started. But then along comes the temptation of Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, 1 through 7, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? God did say that. That's true. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. So he directly contradicts um, uh, God. And of course, we know the rest of the story that, that um, Eve went ahead and took of the fruit and ate, and that's where Pandora's box was opened on planet Earth. You know, of course, Pandora's box, an old Greek a myth about how she opened up that box of curiosity and let all the evils into the world. And that's where they come to because our forefathers uh, Adam and Eve uh, opened the door to Lucifer coming here. Now, so that's where all the pain and suffering we have because God created what kind of a, a creation? What kind of a planet? It was perfect, right? There was no harm, no death, no sorrow, no suffering, no tears, anything like that. But when Satan tempted them, it brought in sin. And sin is the cause of all pain and suffering in our world. So in John 16, Jesus tells us who now is the ruler of this world. Verse 8 and 11. And when he has come, he will convict, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment, and judge, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And so we would think, well, God's the ruler of this world, right? No. You see, when Lucifer, when Satan overcame Adam and Eve, he took the rulership of this world. He is the ruler of this world. That's why when Satan came to God in the book of Job, he came as like a ruler, like the one that was walking up and down, you know, making all the decisions and everybody followed him. In fact, um, yeah, that's, should have waited for that. And then in Zechariah verse 3, uh, Satan opposes uh, the high priest there, right? He's, he comes as the ruler of this world and he's opposing God's putting Joshua on the, prince, on, the, on the throne, as it were, and the Lord rebukes him there. And so when Jesus is met by the devil out in the wilderness, what does he say in Matthew 4, verse 9? And he, the devil, said to Jesus, all these things, he shows them all the, the uh, empires of his world in a, in a um, supernatural way, and I will give to you if you will fall down and what? Worship me. That's exactly what Lucifer wanted in heaven, right? Because Jesus is God. And so Lucifer is just playing out this thing in his temptation of Jesus. He wants worship. And so we realize that Satan is coming here as the one who, who uh, dominates this world. He's got the dominion. He's in charge. 
So when we look at what's happening in the world, friend, when we look at what's happening over in, in um, uh, Palestine right now and in Israel, when we look at what's happening over in, in um, um, Ukraine, when we look at what's happening in our own lives, if they're all upset and upside down, it's not God that's creating it. It's the devil that has brought mayhem into our lives. Revelation 12, 9, he was cast to earth and all his angels were cast out with him. So then it says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has done what? Blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Listen, the devil loves to have people believe that God is the one that's causing all the pain and suffering. And so he blinds their eyes. He blinds them to the reality that the Bible tells us is what's going on. And so the bad things that happen to people are directly caused by by Satan, by the devil. And so, he, because the, the uh, devil has blinded their eyes. And so, when we look at this, we want to ask the question. It's a normal question. Why doesn't God do something then? Right? I mean, we've got this problem here. Lord, you've, you're the one that cast him down here. You're the one that is allowing him to wreak havoc down here. Why don't you do something? Legitimate question, right? Why doesn't, God do, why doesn't God do something if he loves us? I mean, God is love. We hear that all the time, right? Well, if God is love, then what's so loving about all this pain and sorrow, allowing it to, to continue on? Well, let me ask you a question. If you bring a trial to a conclusion before it should be brought to a conclusion... Is that going to give an end result that you want? Let's just, uh, let, 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 me, let me put it this way. If during the Nuremberg trials, you know, after World War II, that they decided after they convicted two or three people, that was enough. Would everybody have been satisfied with the conclusions? No. Because there are a lot more th- bad things that happened that needed to be brought to light and justice needed to be served, right? So, and my, my, my father-in-law was, a, was an MP there, was a military police. And so they had to go all the way to the end and it was sordid, it was ugly, it was, it was gruesome what they had to bring up and, and the things that, that had to be revealed about what people had done. But there were so many other people in the world that if they had not gone through that, they would never have felt like it was fair, that the process had been proper. The same is true here. We can't see it as as it can be seen from God's perspective or from the rest of the universe. God knows that this thing has to be played out perfectly so that sin will never rise again. Do you know the Bible says that? It says in Nahum 1.9, affliction shall not rise up a second time. What God is looking for, friends, is he's looking for a a perfect solution. I I always kind of uh, smile, not in a good way, but I smile inside when I hear people that have had cancer and uh, the surgeon tells them, we got it all. Because you know, friends, nine times out of ten, they don't get it all. And if you leave one cancer cell in that body, It's enough to grow more cancer. God knows that he cannot leave one cancer cell. He cannot leave one sin undealt with. Because he wants to make sure it's all taken care of. Wouldn't it be nice if God had a quick fix button? You know, just hit that thing and everything would be great. Sometimes some things are not that way. It takes a process. And God has done something, friend. He has something, done something. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, down to the earth to take care of this problem, to defeat Lucifer, to defeat Satan. Because remember, Lucifer or Satan believes he has dominion. He's the ruler of the world, right? 
So Jesus came as the second Adam and fought the battle for us, and he came out victorious. And this is all described in the plan of salvation in the sanctuary. It's what I call God's GPS, God's plan of salvation. And it's revealed to us through the sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? The reason he says he's who is so great is that David understood what was taking place. That God was going to destroy the devil in sin. Through the sanctuary um, uh, program uh, process there. And so we see this, this process Going, beginning in the man's, at the beginning of man's history all the way to the end of man's history. And there we see Jesus coming on the cross, and he does not only defeat Satan, but he says this, Luke 23, 33 and 34, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on, right, on the right hand and one on the other. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for what? They know not what they do. Friends, I didn't know what I was doing. And I think for, for all of us, well, I know for all of us, we don't know what we're doing when we fall into sin. We're just growing up what, and doing what's natural, unfortunately. We did not ask to be born. We did not ask to be born with a, a fallen nature. And the only thing that people with fallen natures can do is what? Do fallen things, right? They can sin. And God knows that. And so that's why not only did he defeat uh, the devil and he became the ruler of this world, the new ruler of this world, but he also came to forgive us our sins and offer a way that you and I could have an escape from the sin problem. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, he just doesn't destroy it all. He wants to redeem us. And so on the cross, Jesus died for you and I. And he is there right now looking over the world and doing everything possible to save every man, woman, and child. So let me end with this question and answer. That's the big picture. So what does it look like in your life? If your life is anything like mine, you've got some pretty difficult things that you had to go through. And you may be asking the question, why, Lord? Why did you allow me to go through that? Why did you allow my wife to, to have brain cancer two weeks after we got married? Why did you allow my daughter to die? Why did you not answer my prayers? Because we prayed. And the Bible says, ask anything in my name and I will do it. It also says, if it be according to my will. Right? So, so here's the answer, what I found. As I look back on that cancer thing that my wife and I went through, that I went through with my wife, I thought it was the worst thing possible that could happen to me, to us. Just totally destroyed the family. Devastating. And yet both of us now, God healed her. You saw her the other night, I think, some of you. But... Both my wife and I look back at that and we say, I am glad the Lord allowed us to go through that. We learned so many things, not only about how to take care of our body, but we saw God work miracles for us that we would never have seen if we hadn't go through, gone through that difficult time. It didn't make any sense to us at the time. But God worked miracles. We saw that while we were going through the trial, that God was right by our side. And he was providing all our needs, all the things that we needed. And he was building our characters. He was building us into better people. Do you know that you can't become a better person by just uh, sitting on a lounge chair on a Hawaiian island um, beach? You can't become a better person that way. It, go, it comes through trials. You know what I'm talking about. You go through trials and you, you get strength through them, courage through them. Anybody try to build muscle, you know, lose weight? It takes some work. 
And God knows that he can build better people and help us to trust him more by trials. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we don't always understand why the trials are there. But we do know from the picture that we've had painted tonight that you're not the one that allowed evil. You're not the one that created evil. But that because you gave each one of us the power of choice, we have the opportunity to choose what direction we want to go. So Lord, when those difficult things happen, Lord, help us to choose you. And may all the people that are in Israel right now, and the bombs and the rockets are falling on them, Lord, may they choose you. May they cling to you in this time of their need. And may we make a decision, Lord, that we're going to choose the better thing and not give in to the devil's designs. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.